Man, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Always so good to be home. This will always be home for Lindsay and I. Uh, we love this place so dearly. How many know every pastor needs a pastor? Yeah. Amen? And this is my pastor right here. And uh, man, I, I don't look at him in the eye when I talk about this or I'll, I'll break, break down, but uh, we would not be where we're at today without people who believe in you and love you and speak life over you and support you. And the support that North Church and Pastor Rodney and Shannon have given us is just tremendous. And we're 12 years old as the church and they're still supporting us in so many different ways and we're so grateful for that. Uh, back in 2009, we left here to plant City Church and uh, we started Seed Network, a church planting organization. We've been able to plant 27 churches now through, through City Church. So I want you to know, amen. I wanna know that you know the seed that you planted in us has, uh, has multiplied. And that's what you do when you give to the kingdom of God. It's not just giving to one thing, it's what God does with it exponentially, amen? If you got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter six. We're gonna be there this morning as we continue our series, Beloved, Beloved, sorry. We gotta get that right and make sure there was a big controversy on that, heard about that. I'm gonna just jump right in this morning. Uh, one of my favorite pastors and theologians to study is a guy by the name of Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody heard of him? Love uh, reading about him because he grew up, obviously pastored in such a tumultuous time in the 1930s in Germany, and I love history and I love studying about that. And, and he grew up in a time where obviously the church was being pressed by the Nazi regime and Hitler and, 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 and being forced to kind of conform to, to, to certain values that they had and give up certain things. And in 1934, Karl Barth and Diedrich Bonhoeffer actually put together this document with other pastors and leaders that said, hey, we're gonna pledge our allegiance to Christ alone. And we're gonna stand in the face of, of difficulty. Now, obviously in the mid 30s, it was just no idea in the next decade, the horror that would, what would befall the world in one of the darkest times in human history. But they took that stand in 1934. In 1935, Diedrich Bonhoeffer was invited to start an underground seminary where he would train pastors and leaders in kind of this rural area of Germany in one of the most tumultuous times, again, in human history. We needed pastors, we needed leaders, we needed theologians and scholars. And so they went off into this kind of underground seminary where they began to really take the words of Jesus literally. What does it mean to lead, lead a Jesus life, to think like Jesus, to act like Jesus? And they had this repetition of study and prayer and community that was rather intense. In fact, people on the outside would look at this underground seminary and they would be like, you need to slow your roll a little bit. It all seems a little bit much. Like, why do you feel the need to do all of these things? Some of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's incredible books, The Cost of Discipleship and Life Together would come out of this group of individuals that chose to live an authentic Jesus life. The story goes something like this, that one of Diedrich Bonhoeffer's closest friends came to visit him in Germany and they got in a boat together and Diedrich, he kind of paddled down the way and they climbed up to this embankment where they could look out over this Nazi kind of airport. There were fighter planes everywhere and soldiers and tanks and all of these things that was just growing by the day. And Diedrich looked at his friends and he said, he said, look at the allegiance that they have. Look how their numbers grow. And then he said something next that just has always stuck with me. He says, this has got to be stronger than that. This discipleship to Jesus has to be stronger than any cultural formation out there any other thought or way of living. Yes. And he began to challenge these leaders and groups of, groups of people that were studying, this has to be stronger than that. Yes. Our loyalties to the ways of Jesus have to be greater than compromise. Because how many know it's easy to compromise? Yes. Our commitment to the kingdom must override our allegiances to all other kingdoms. This must be stronger than that. Now, I've shared this story a few times over the years, and even people look at me and they're like, Pastor Matt, you need to slow your roll a little bit. That's all a little bit heavy for me, and it seems a little bit much. And, and I would look at them and say, but, but there's a lot at stake, isn't there? There's still a lot at stake. The reputation of the church is at stake, and, and, and I wanna keep the reputation of, of the church as a Jesus people, people that look and think and act like Jesus. How many know there's 20 million young people in every generation in the United States that walk away from their faith? Not while I'm pastoring. Like, I wanna be a part of that solution, right? Yes. You know that it's really in vogue, like the popular thing to do is to deconstruct your faith. You know what's really hard? To reconstruct something that looks like Jesus. Yes. Anybody can deconstruct. Yes. It's really hard to reconstruct, and, and now people are just walking, young people are walking away their faith, so don't tell me there's not much at stake. Yes. 
And the church is just like anything else are giving in to, to certain small little heresies or false gospels that can just kind of slip in the back door and don't seem like much, but they make the church powerless. Secularism, consumerism. When you put nation over God, any of those things can sneak in the back door and actually make the church powerless. So there's a lot at stake. And, and, and my call is to a generation just to come back and say, hey, the simplicity of what does it mean to follow Jesus, to take the Beatitudes seriously. The Beatitudes can't be background noise to us. The Sermon on the Mount can't just be a good sermon that Jesus preached. They've gotta be life, they gotta be how we live. We gotta get back to the simplicity of following Jesus in everything that we do. Let me give you a, a, a kind of an idea of, of, of how I believe that we do this. Number one, we gain a vision for Christ's likeness. It sounds simple, but it's not easy. What does it look like to live like Jesus? Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus came to give his life away, right? What does it look like to live and to be like Jesus? What I think this requires is no more secondhand knowledge. If you're a follower of Jesus, you can't get your knowledge secondhand. You can't because, oh, I listened to this guy or I read this book or this podcast. Those things are great, but you have to go to the source. You have to immerse yourself in the words of Jesus and the gospels, amen? amen? Getting back to the simplicity, the greatest picture of the clarity of what the kingdom of God will look like then is what Jesus lived and what he talks about in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's the clearest representation of the kingdom of God. It's gotta dictate how we live, what we do. Number two is this, we must be aware of how we've been deformed. All of us are being shaped by something. You're being shaped by something. And to have the self-awareness and the courage and the audacity to say, yeah, I understand, I'm being shaped. I've been shaped by the culture that I grew up in, the family values that I inherited, the people that I listen to, the friendship groups I have, the things that I choose to read, the news outlet that I turn on. How many know things are shaping us every day, right? And to have the self-awareness to look to say, am I being formed into the image of the world and the culture or am I being formed into the image of Jesus? That's the question that we have to regularly ask. I think this is why Romans 12 too. You remember that passage? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. It assumes there's some patterns of the world that you and I are all being formed to, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which leads us to this third one. We must implement rhythms and practices of Jesus formation. It's a different message for a different time, but I, I believe one of the problems we have in the church today is we have a spiritual formation problem. We can't show up and think and talk and live like Jesus if we're not spending regular time at the feet of Jesus. The last three months of City Church, we have literally led our people through Jesus practices. What does it mean to Sabbath? What does it mean for solitude? What does your prayer life look like? Your daily rhythms, your monthly rhythms, your, your, your weekly rhythms, your annual rhythms. How do you immerse yourself with rhythms that are transformative? You don't just show up and act and talk like Jesus. They're rhythms that you implement every day. Are you with me? Everyday rhythms. John chapter six probably one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible. I have always been drawn to difficult chapters in the Bible. I'm just that guy, you're, I'm like, I like it. And I know some people, uh, these, this is a, a chapter of the Bible that they probably just read through really quickly. It's not a feel good uh, chapter, it's difficult. Uh, and, and sometimes when you hit a difficult passage, what do you do with it? You skip over it, you kind of just interpret however you want to interpret it, you assume Jesus didn't really mean that. What, what do we do with it? I think, the difficult passages can actually lead us to incredible truth that sometimes we avoid because it is uncomfortable. What's happening in John chapter six is the crowds are growing around Jesus. Every day people are like, you've gotta come see this guy who's healed the sick, the miracles he's doing are just remarkable. In fact, not only that, but he just took loaves of bread and fish and multiplied it and we ate till we couldn't eat anymore. So we got a show and a meal, right? And so Jesus would go across the Sea of Galilee and they would figure out where he was going and they would go there and out of his compassion, he would begin to teach them and, and heal the sick. And so they're just following Jesus from place to place. And how many know, here's what we learn about Jesus. If you follow Jesus for a while in the crowds, eventually Jesus is going to turn around and ask you to pick up your cross and follow him. He gives you the space to discover who he is but eventually he's gonna call you to the cross to give your life away. Let's pick up this uncomfortable passage in John chapter six, verse 26 says this. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, 
You are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus understands their motives. In fact, in verse 30, what they would say to Jesus is this, what sign will you give us today that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Give us this bread. They are crying out for Jesus to give them more bread. You fed us last week, feed us again. And Jesus says, here I am. How many know that's a a good example of when you don't get what you really want? No, Jesus, we don't want you. We want the benefits of following you, right? We wanna eat. We wanna see a show. When, When are you gonna do this? I mean, this is what it's like to be consumers, and and we just naturally live in a a time and a place where it's easy for us to fall into a consumer mentality, isn't it? Like, and this is what the people around Jesus are are doing to him. You you don't want me. You want to be entertained. You, You don't want me. You want me on your own terms. You want the benefits of me. Let's continue. Verse 35. It gets worse. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. How do you get somebody to believe something they don't see or want to believe? It's really hard, isn't it? They're asking for this actual bread, and Jesus says, you think that you need this actual bread, but what you really need is me, because you've been eating this actual bread, and, and, but it just leaves you hungry again, Right? Because that's what consumerism does. It doesn't matter how much you consume. Like you can get the thing that you've always wanted. You can get the car, the lake house, the stuff. And then afterwards you're like, well, that didn't do it, right? It just doesn't do it. And so Jesus is trying to get them to something better and they still are down here. No, we just want the stuff. And Jesus says, you don't even know what you don't even know. You don't need that. You, You need me and all of me. And Jesus is trying to confront this idea that consumerism just doesn't work, it doesn't satisfy, because guess what? Nothing will ever satisfy as long as you're at the center of it. Shout me down when I'm preaching good, come on now. (laughs) Nothing will satisfy when you and I are at the center, because that's not how God has designed us. Now, I'm sure that you don't have any of these here at North or in Oklahoma City, but in Tulsa, we have some people that like to church shop. They just jump from place to place, right? And so whatever's new, whatever's the best, they kind of move around. And so, you know, I've been pastoring there for 12 years now. And so I know a lot of people come in and they kind of have their list. And a lot of times they're in there, they've got this list in their head and they kind of, they'll go into the welcome room and they're like, pastor, do you have this and this? And let me, let me tell you, I'm 100% for finding a church that you resonate with the mission and the vision. But at some point you have to realize there's no perfect church, right? But some people have a really hard, how do you show something to somebody they don't want to see? A couple of months ago, we had this lady come in our church and she's in the welcome room with me and she has a clipboard and an actual list. Never seen that. There's 12 things on it. And she's going through the list and I kind of chuckle at first because I think it's a joke and it's not. She's offended that I was laughing at it. And she's, it's not like, like doctrinal. It's very specific. Like, do you have this and that? And I'm going to be honest with you. Like my heart broke for her. I, I really did. I was like, man, What's gonna happen is you're gonna live on the surface level of every place that you ever go because as long as you're at the center, it's never gonna satisfy. Like the church doesn't exist for you, you exist for the, the church, the body of Christ. And how do, again, how do you get someone to understand a truth that you've realized that they're not there yet? And Jesus is here with the crowd and he's understood this truth and, and they're not there because they're consumers. And, you, you, you go to a nice restaurant, you're gonna drop a lot of money on a nice meal, right? You, you have expectations of like the service and the wait staff, don't you? Like I do. I, if I'm gonna pay this much money, I, I want this steak to be really good. And we kind of take that mentality, which is not altogether evil, and we kind of bring it over into our faith in the body of Christ, and then and we're like, okay, what do you got for me? And we live on the surface level, never really going deeper, never experiencing something more what God has for us. You know what happens in John chapter six? They begin to grumble because grumbling is naturally what consumers will eventually do. It's only a matter of time, right? Until you can't meet expectation. 
It's a matter of time before you disagree with me on something. It's, a, it's only a matter of time. And so they begin to grumble. If, you're, if you picture this in your mind, imagine this crowd of people that have been following Jesus and the people in the very back are they're like, mm, if you're not feeding us, I'm not sticking around. Like if you're not gonna do a miracle, we're gonna leave. And then this grumbling and Jesus probably hears it and one by one, they're kind of walking away. Jesus is losing the crowd. What's gonna happen? Let's find out. Verse 53. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up that last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. 100% honesty with you. Over the years of my theological study and journey, I have wrestled with this text. Let me tell you what makes this text uncomfortable to me. Jesus knows that the crowd is leaving. He knows that people are walking away. And you know what he doesn't do? I'm so sorry, I didn't really mean that. Come back. No, don't, please, please don't. He, he doesn't do that. Jesus may have been the worst mega church pastor in human history, right? <laughs> in fact, I, I think Jesus' board would have come in and said, hey, we're down 30% this year from tennis last year. We're not, we're, we may have to make some change. I mean, this is what's happening to the crowd. And you know what he does? He doubles down. He intentionally uses provocative language that would further tick them off. And I just don't know what your response would be, but my natural response is to like, I'm gonna lighten it a little bit. I'm gonna smooth off the edges, make it a little bit easier to go down. Not only does he not do that, but he says, guess what? You're gonna need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now he's not taking, talking literally, but he is saying, you have to take all of me. You've wanted to take some of me, that's no longer on the table. You take all of me. And then he tells a bunch of Jews to drink his blood. Like they spent their whole life, Jewish laws and regulations, avoiding anything with blood in it. Like that's, that's somewhat provocative, offensive language, and yet Jesus presents it to them. Let me tell you why Jesus, I believe that Jesus does this. It's because Jesus is, is saying this. He's, he, he, our natural propensity is to do this. We're gonna lower the bar of expectations so right down here, right? When you lower the bar, what happens? Everybody can just do this. Look how easy that was. You can do that, I can do that, there's nothing to that. So we're gonna naturally lower the bar and this is what sometimes we're guilty of doing in the church and I've done it before. And Jesus does the opposite. And you have to wrestle with this tension for a minute of what Jesus does. Jesus takes this bar of discipleship and he goes, nope, it's up here. Why does Jesus do this? Out of his love for you. That's what's really hard to understand about this passage. It's because we see people who are offended, we see people who are walking away, and we're like, man, that's a, that's a hard message. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but there's no life found in this. Right, there's no light. You, you can't half-heartedly follow Jesus. And so Jesus is gonna raise this bar of discipleship, and the crowds are gonna begin to thin out. Why? Because he knows that this leads to life, and this leads to death. And I'm grateful for that. I don't know about you. If you're taking notes and following along, number one, Why does Jesus do this? Jesus calls us out of our idolatry and the systems of death that we're stuck in and into true life. That's the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you know the Holy Spirit is not nearly as concerned with your comfort as you are? The Holy Spirit is concerned with your freedom. And so the Holy Spirit is continually drawing you out of systems of death and untruth and lies that you've accepted about who you are, who God is, or what the world has said. He's leading you out of that. And you're either gonna be responsive to that or you're gonna reject that. Jesus does this because he is trying to say this consumer mentality leads to death and you're gonna spiral in this same place and you're just gonna be stuck time and time again because it's never gonna fulfill you. And yet here I am, the bread of life, take me. Take me. We learn in the Gospel of John, you can't superficially follow Jesus in John's Gospel. Nobody rides the fence in John's Gospel. Literally, you're either a follower of Jesus going with Jesus to Jerusalem to the cross, or you're in the crowd saying, crucify him. There's no like, you, you, can't, you can't sit on the fence. Number two is this, Jesus 
knew that maximum kingdom impact will not happen through the multitudes or the crowds, but through the few. This is a hard truth. As a pastor, this is a hard truth for me because I would rather preach to a full room. But you know what sometimes we need more than a full room? We need to raise the standard of discipleship and say, man, it's all. It's all of Jesus. Amen? It's all of Jesus. And it's so counterintuitive to think that God could do more with less, isn't it? We know that God wants all people to come to repentance. We know that God loves all people. And yet at this time, Jesus allowed people to walk away because he knew that he could have maximum kingdom impact with a few people who will wholeheartedly in for Jesus, not reserving anything or holding anything back. Let's continue to read. It gets worse. (laughs) Next time I come to North Church, I'm gonna have a really good, feel good message for you. Not today. All right. Verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said this to them, does this offend you? Does this offend you? This this word offense in in the Greek is skandalizomai, where we get the word scandal. Is this a stumbling block for you? Does the gospel offend you? You you know what's pretty remarkable uh, about the gospel, the good news? For some people, it is good news. I was stuck in my sin and I could not rescue myself and Jesus stepped into my mess and took upon himself what I could not do and he rescued me. You know what the gospel is for other people? Offensive. Are you telling me that Jesus is the only way to salvation? Because everybody around me in the culture will tell me that if I actualize, self-actualize and project self and I find what's deep down inside me and I pursue just this purpose that is, that is here, that I'll find life. It's a cultural lie. Life is found in the creator of life, the person who knits you together in your mother's womb. You don't find life in of yourself. You find it in him. That's offensive. Jesus is the only way to salvation? No, I want Jesus as a a way, and you get to pick. It's offensive to some, and yet it's salvation to others. How many know that many times when you confront Jesus, you're gonna leave, leave, leave feeling affirmed and encouraged, and there are times you're gonna leave, and you're gonna feel convicted and challenged, and guess what? Even offended. The gospel will sometimes offend us, So here's a tough question that I have for you as I'm wrapping this up this morning. Will you allow the gospel to offend you? Will we continue to allow the words of Jesus to counteract our presupposition, our assumptions, the things that we maybe culturally or we grew up believing because it's not consistent with the teaching of Jesus? More than ever before, we need the people of God to be the people of God, to look like Jesus, Will we humbly submit ourselves to the church, to the leading of the Holy Spirit? One of the prayers that I pray all the time is, Father, shine your spotlight on my heart, on me, when I attempt to elevate my opinions or beliefs above love for my brothers and sisters. Would you help me see that in me? When I would rather be right than loving, Father, help me out of your compassion for me. Father, out of your grace for me, challenge me when I try to fit the kingdom of God into my left or right wing politics instead of allowing my politics to be shaped by the kingdom of God. And the people of God said, amen, right? That's hard to do. You have opinions and so do I. And and we get in those, Father, help me when I've believed in untruth. Father, help me have a spirit of discernment. Can I tell you my prayer right now for the church, not just your church or my church, but the church is a spirit of discernment. We need discernment. You know where discernment comes from? It comes from the people of God who are rooted in the word of God and are being obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit and are in community with each other. You know where discernment doesn't come? Isolation. That was really good. I didn't say that in the other services. I should have. (laughs) It does. That's why we need each other. That's why we, we submit ourselves. We have been, I, I've been trying to lead my church, the last, especially the last few years, to say, you know what we do to the essential matters of the faith? We, we hold them like this and we fight for the essential matters, right? You know what we do with the, the non-essential matters? We go like this. We hold them loosely. 
and we show the world how you can be unified even when you disagree and don't look alike, yes. right? Yes. You know what we just did a minute ago? We came to the table together and Pastor Oscar led us. You know what that was symbolizing? That Jesus is enough to bring us together. Yes. I love that. And if we don't do that in here, how do we show a world out there? How do we show them? Literally, when you're coming to the table and you're taking that bread and you're taking the blood, you're saying, you know what? I, I am bound in community with you because you love Jesus and I love Jesus and Jesus is everything. Even though you look different from me, you speak a different language, you voted different than me, you have different, you have a, you, like your team won last night and my team lost and that's the power of the gospel at work. Come on. Some of you, that's close to home right now. The power of the gospel, isn't it? To show a world saying, guess what? We are united in the essentials. We, don't, we have diversity though. There's diversity in the body of Christ and that's a good thing. Amen. And we don't always see things eye to eye, but guess what? We do things differently than the world is. I'm not gonna cancel you because I disagree with you. No, I'm gonna lean into the body of Christ. Let, let me tell you, uh, this is not my, really my message is, sorry, but I, I'm gonna take 30 seconds on this. Let me tell you the characteristics I believe will define followers of Jesus in the time that we live in is humility, because it's what the world is lacking. You know what humility requires? An open heart and open hands to say, Father, I continually submit my life, my ideas, my ideologies and worldviews to you, to the body of Christ, to authority. Let me, let me ask you this, is there anybody in your life who has the right to speak truth into your life? Have you given anybody that right? And I have surrounded myself with people, men and women, who I've said, I have given you the keys to come into my life, and if you see inconsistencies, if you wanna challenge something, you absolutely can challenge that because I know you love me, and I need it. If the church is gonna stand before God one day and be who, we've called to be, who God's called us to be, guess what? We have to submit ourselves to each other. We can't be lone rangers and isolated alone with our little echo chambers, just, just hearing one thing and being formed into the image of the world and expect to remain faithful to the ways of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Last thing is this, John chapter six, verse 66, which is the toughest verses out of all of them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you know how excruciating that must have been, even for Jesus? I mean, Jesus is fully God, but he's fully man. He feels. And it, we started with the crowd, and then it was a group of Jews, and now it's disciples. And they're like, man, this is, this is difficult. I'm not sure I can do this. And they begin to walk away and turn their backs. You know what is the same today as it was in the first century? This truth. The crowd will rarely lead us to true discipleship to Jesus. The crowd will rarely lead you to true discipleship to Jesus. Study the crowd in scripture. Let me remind you that Christianity has always been and will always be a countercultural movement. That's why Jesus said the road to life over here is narrow. It's a narrow gate and a few find it. And this road over here to destruction is wide. You cannot float down the river of the culture, no matter whether they call themselves Christian or not, and expect to look and live like Jesus. We have always and we always will jump off the raft and we'll swim upstream. And we will fight to preserve a Jesus life, to live in light of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. It's difficult. Some of you young people in the room, you better learn this now. You're like, oh, but I'm, a, I'm in a Christian environment. You better learn how to swim upstream. I grew up in a Christian school, didn't help me. I had to learn to swim upstream. I, even in a Christian environment, I had to step off the boat and say, no, I'm gonna look like Jesus, not like other people. Good. Right? It's hard, it's difficult but it's what Jesus calls you to. The voice of the crowd is all around you, often drowning out the voice of Jesus in our lives, calling you to Christ's likeness. Let me tell you, church, this 
must be stronger than that. We have to lead the way in love, in unity, in Christ-likeness. We cannot be shaped by the world and lead a gospel movement. And how many know our cities and our towns and our neighborhoods and our businesses, they need Jesus. Stand to your feet with me across this room if you would. In an uncomfortable message, I'm gonna end in kind of an uncomfortable way. And I'm just gonna call us to a time of corporate repentance. You're about to go into the book of Revelation. You know what God does to the, church in Reve- the churches in Revelation? Oftentimes he corrects them. He'll say, change your ways or I'll put out your light. He, he commends them for their faithfulness. I, I want Jesus to return to a church that says, well done. Man, you persevered, you were faithful. You didn't give in, you could have, but you didn't. You know how we get there? We continually put our hands up and our palms up and we repent and we humble ourselves at the foot of the cross and we don't assume that we've got it figured out. And there's some things that you've been holding on to and you're like, I've got this market corner. You, You say, no, I submit them to you, Jesus. Can we just do that right now? Can we do that in this next moment? Let me remind some of you in this room, the, the, the Christian journey is one of descent to ascent. You have to die with Christ in order to live with Christ, amen? And how, how many know we need to die often? Father, right now we submit ourselves to you. Just corporately at the church, a time of repentance that we just lift up our hearts, our ideas, the things that we've grabbed onto. God, if there are any cultural lies, if there are any untruths the enemy is currently using in our hearts and minds as a stronghold, would you rip those from us? God, we submit everything we have right now, open-handed at the foot of the cross. There is nothing that you can't touch. There's nothing that you can't have. Father, raise the bar of discipleship and we will say, Jesus, we want all of you. We want all of you not parts of you, not the parts that are convenient. We give you everything today, Jesus, knowing that one day you're gonna return for your church. And God, we pray that you, as you return for this church, you'll say, well done. Well done, church. You were faithful. You made it. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.